Good evening, everyone. It's a blessing to be back at Advent Hope. We were trying to figure out when the last time I was here. It was uh, probably six or seven years, something like that. It was a while ago. Anyway, it was a blessing last time, and I'm sure it's going to be a blessing this weekend to uh, just catch up, see what you're doing, get acquainted with some of you again. A uh, special thanks to Vanta and Ted for taking care of me and for Josie for making all the arrangements, and you guys have been wonderful. And I just want to extend a warm, happy Sabbath. It's, uh, I don't know if it's quite Sabbath yet, but we should be getting pretty close. Amen? Uh, and, you know, I'm thankful for you coming out tonight because I know Friday night is a good night to just sort of stay home and rest, right? And uh, so you must be like the hardcore members that want to come out every chance there's an opportunity to learn something. And so anyway, I just want to commend you for coming out. I've prepared something a little bit special, not something I normally talk about. And so hopefully this is the right group for that. Um, something a little more sensitive maybe than what I usually do. So pray for me that God will give me wisdom to know just what to say and how to say it. Because, you know, the reality is there is a lot of stress and tension in our world, and I'm not sure we're really talking about it maybe as well as we should be, or we're arguing in ways that aren't really very helpful. Uh, there's a lot of conflict in the world. There's a lot of anger and polarization, and uh, it's only going to get worse in the coming weeks as we head into this big election. So I think it's worth spending a little bit of time looking at what's happening in our world and what is just about to come. Uh, particularly, I want to talk about the topic of liberty, of freedom. Freedom's important, don't you think? It's something precious, something valuable, something worth talking about. And we know this, that the Bible predicts that there's going to come an attack on freedom in this country. And so if we truly believe that we are living near the end of time and that Jesus is about to return, then we should expect that attack on freedom to be even closer. Amen? I mean, it should be just right on the brink. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that might look like and how we can prepare ourselves. But before we get into the message, I do want to pause for just a moment and have a word of prayer. I invite you to bow your heads. I'm going to kneel and just pray the Holy Spirit will be with us tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you for opportunities like this to meet and gather and just reflect on your word a little bit. I pray that you would send the Holy Spirit to be here in our midst. Be especially with me, give me uh, strength, clarity of mind, uh, uh, the discernment to know what to say, what not to say. Be with each listener here, Lord, that your spirit would interpret the words in just the right way. That it would be a blessing to each person. And I thank you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we have a long history of freedom in this country going all the way back, I guess you could say farther, but going at least back to the Declaration of Independence in 1776, penned by Thomas Jefferson. It's an amazing document. If you haven't read it in a while, it's worth looking at. It's beautiful. It's inspiring. The word is amazing. The wording is amazing. I had a member of my last church who actually memorized the Declaration of Independence, and he did a whole recitation. It was pretty impressive. It's an important doc document, and in many ways, that's regarded as the kind of the birth of our country. At least it sparked us on our path to independence as a nation. Some 87 years later, Abraham Lincoln, in his famous Gettysburg Address, he described that event, the signing of the Declaration, in these words. He said, four score and seven years ago, you've heard this before, right? Our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. I, I like that idea that this nation was conceived in liberty. Now, it's true, we've not always lived up to our ideals. I'm not going to talk about that. But we were birthed with this idea, this desire to, to fight against tyranny, to promote democracy. And this was a major step in the history of our world because from the United States, it spread around the world to many other countries. A grand experiment in freedom. In the great controversy, you'll read that the reason that we have been blessed so wonderfully in this country is because of our love of freedom. That's given us our prosperity and our success as a nation. So it's a big thing. It's important. 
I read this little interesting tidbit, a couple little, uh, couple little uh, side notes before we get into the main points. Apparently, George Washington, immediately after the Declaration of Independence was ratified, he took it out and read it on the steps of the Capitol building in New York to this loud, raucous crowd that was all enthusiastic and zealous. And, they, and immediately after they heard the words of the Declaration of Independence, they ran over to a big statue of King George and they knocked it over. And ultimately, they melted it down and they made more, more than 40,000, 43,000 cannonballs, not cannonballs, uh, musket balls for their rifles. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty uh, good start to this country. Fledging, fledgling army getting its ammunition right there from a statue of King George. Another inter interesting story I heard one time was uh, about uh, there, when they first made the Declaration of Independence, they had a printer by the name of Dunlap. He printed like uh, several hundred copies and they sent them out to all through the colonies. And so these original copies were called Dunlap Broadsides. A man in Philadelphia bought a, a picture frame for $4 at a yard sale, and he opened it up, and guess what he found inside the frame? He found one of those Dunlop broadsides. It was worth more than $8 million. How would you like that kind of freedom, you know? Money brings a certain kind of freedom. But that's not the freedom I want to talk about tonight. Freedom is important. Every one of us, we have a desire for it. It's right in our very breath. We long for freedom. As long as we have life, we want freedom. And it's important. Many times we don't appreciate it till it's taken from us. But as long as we have freedom, we should remember it, we should acknowledge it, we should celebrate it. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about liberty, and this is really what I want to talk about tonight. If I had time, we could do a much deeper study in what the Bible has to say about true biblical freedom, but a few verses immediately come to my mind. For example, in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, maybe you know the verse, some of you probably do. Jesus was speaking to the Jews that believed on him, and he said, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and the truth shall make you free. Now, clearly, this is a different kind of freedom than what I've been talking about so far, because this is not talking about a political freedom. They were already under the bondage of the nation of Rome, and he wasn't talking about breaking free from Rome. He was talking about a completely different kind of freedom. He was talking about a spiritual freedom, an inner freedom, something that is incomparable and unconquerable, something the world can never take away. Something that's not guaranteed by any constitution or by any Supreme Court or any political leader. This is a different kind of freedom that's completely separate from political freedoms. In John 8, 36, Jesus said, If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Right? This is an even better kind of freedom, an even better kind of liberty. Paul said something similar in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is verse 17, right near the end of the chapter. You may remember this verse as well. It says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. Wherever the Spirit of God is, when the Spirit of God comes into our life, it gives us a certain kind of liberty, this liberty, this freedom that Jesus was talking about. In the context here, uh, Paul was talking about the Jews, how they had a veil over their eyes, and they couldn't see clearly. And it was that veil that kept them in bondage. And he said, when that veil is taken away, when they're able to see clearly, the Holy Spirit comes in and gives them freedom. And this is what Paul wanted them to experience, that true freedom. It's a powerful passage. It has nothing to do with government or politics. It has everything to do with turning back to God. The, the kind of freedom I want to talk about tonight is something that is supernatural. It's something that's spiritual, that's separate from the things that are going on in our world. Something that God and God alone can give to us, and it cannot be taken away by anything that happens in our political system here. Am I making a little bit of sense so far? Nod your head if, you make, if I'm making sense. Okay, I'm not so sure. You guys... Uh, do you guys, by the way, do you usually say like amen, or is this like one of those churches that just never says anything? Okay, say amen. Let me hear you. Amen. All right, so we need a different kind of freedom, right? We want the kind of freedom that only God can give that the world cannot take away no matter what it does. That's important. Thank you. There's another verse that comes to my mind. I'm just thinking through some that just sort of come up. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. 
Here, Paul says to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, that's good counsel. We should stand free in this liberty that God wants to give us. Now, I suppose you can make a case from this verse that we as Christians have some obligation to fight for our freedoms in the political sphere, especially our religious freedoms. But I don't think that is primarily what this verse is talking about. It's not about those freedoms that we get from our political systems. It's about the spiritual freedom that comes to us when the Holy Spirit comes into our life. It's something that cannot be taken away by the political world. It's that inner freedom that comes when the Holy Spirit fills us. And that's what we need to stand fast in and not be distracted by other things, well, that are distractions. There's a lot of people that are getting distracted by what's happening in this world, and they forget that the only freedom that's going to count in the end is the freedom that God can give. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to work on you guys a little bit, see if I can get a few more amens. I had to train my church back in Indiana. Like, they were like just mumbling a little bit. I say, amen? They say, amen, amen? So you got to help me out a little bit, okay? You got to remember, too, that I'm, uh, it's a little past my bedtime. This is like 10.30 for me at home, so I'm not used to preaching this late. Anyway, turn with me in your Bible to Galatians 5. I'm going to look at that passage just a little bit more. Galatians chapter 5. This is a really interesting passage in terms of talking about freedom. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 is the verse I just read. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Let's not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage and so on. If you skip down to verse 5, you'll see the kind of freedom he's really talking about. Look at verse 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. That's the freedom we want, right? The power of the Holy Spirit to give us righteousness. This is what our hope is. We're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and empower us. This is what we want. This is our, the freedom that we're longing for. In the next verse, it says, For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor un uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. That's the kind of freedom we need. The kind that comes from a faith that's rooted in a love for God. Now, it doesn't matter whether we're Jew or Gentile, whether we're male or female, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're black or white or brown or whatever our ethnic background. And it doesn't even matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. Amen? The kind of freedom that God gives, none of those things avail anything. If you think one political party or one political leader is going to give you freedom, then we're not talking about the same kind of freedom because none of the parties in our world, no political leader in our world can give us the kind of freedom that Paul's talking about here. This can only come from the Holy Spirit. It only comes from Jesus Christ. And this is our hope. This is what we're waiting for. Amen? This is what we're waiting for as a people. We're waiting for righteousness by faith. And we're hoping for that. We're longing for that. We know it only comes from God. None of these other things avail anything. There's no other way to get this freedom. Look at verse 7. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You know, it's sad, friends, because uh, I've seen people go down this road. They're going down distractions. And I think they lose their way. They started out well. They were running. They were men and women of faith. They, they had their confidence in Christ, and they got caught up in politics thinking that that was going to be their salvation. That was what's going to be their source of freedom. And they lose their hold on God. They ran well. They started well, but somehow they lost their way. Maybe some of you know people like that. I certainly do. And it burns my heart because I wonder where they're going to end up. It's the wrong kind of freedom. They misunderstand what the Bible is promising us, and they're going down the wrong path. They're going to the wrong solution to get the freedom that they think they need. Look at verse 8. This persuasion comes not of him that calleth you. In other words, this obsession that people are getting caught up in is not from heaven. Amen? This persuasion is not from Jesus Christ. People are getting caught up in things, and you know who's getting them caught up in it? It's the enemy. Am I saying too much? Am I stepping on any toes or anything? I hope not. I mean, this, the enemy is working, right? He's trying to tear our church apart. 
This persuasion is not from Jesus Christ. It's from the enemy. And look at the next verse. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. All we have to do is open the door just a little bit, get a little bit caught up in this, and before you know it, it leavens our whole way of thinking. It leavens everything. Amen? Amen? Yeah, okay, that's a little better. <laughs> oh, it reminds me of that verse 2 Corinthians 11.3 where it says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds, my minds, our friends' minds could be corrupted away from the simplicity that is in Christ. We can be distracted, we can be drawn away from the true gospel because there is so much energy in our world today, in the political sphere, and, and not just in politics, but in every aspect of life. There is so much energy out there. We have to stay connected to Christ or we're going to be caught up and distracted. And a little leaven is all it takes to leaven the whole lump. Amen? Anyway, it just takes a little bit. You want to know how serious this problem is? I want to share with you a quote. I don't normally read quotes, but this one was so powerful. It's like one of my, my most recent favorite quote in the whole spirit of prophecy. I was reading the book, Counselors to Writers and uh, uh, Publishers. Uh, Counselors to Writers and Teachers or whatever. Anyway, I forget the name of it. But anyway, I found this quote and it amazed me. Listen to the words of this. The influence, she says, she was talking to editors and she was advising them what kind of things to include in our publications. Okay, that's the context. She says, the influence of most of the periodicals of the day, we would say now our news magazines or our Twitter or, or you know, social media, whatever, YouTube, wherever we're getting our news source, the, the, the influence of most of these news sources is such as to render the word of God distasteful. And to destroy a relish for all useful and instructive reading. Now, she was saying this about the news sources in her day. What would she say about the news sources today that are like on steroids being run by these artificial intelligence algorithms that know just exactly how to trigger you with the worst possible reactions? I mean, that's what they're designed to do is to get you engaged, to get you responding, get you irritated, get you agitated. I mean, way beyond any kind of publication she had in her days, it's got to be at least 10 times or 100 times worse today. The secular papers, she continues, are filled with accounts of murders and robberies and other revolting crimes, and the mind of the reader dwells on the scenes of vice therein depicted. Now, by the way, this is exactly what happens on social media. All the worst stories get circulated, and they get presented to you. And if you follow down one of these rabbit holes, you're going to see more and more, and it's going to sound like it's getting worse and worse and worse. It just keeps dra dragging us down. She says the mind is influenced by the things that it's looking at. The mind of the reader dwells on the scenes of ice and depicted. When we, when we do this, she says, the reading of sensational or demoralizing literature becomes a habit, like the use of opium or other baleful drugs. We become physiologically addicted to this epinephrine. I don't know, some of you are better medical people. You know whatever the drug is. we got these hormones in our brain. They get released when we read something that's stimulating and we get addicted to our own news. I mean, this is physiological. She's not talking metaphorical. She knows exactly what she's saying. It's like opium. It's like these baleful drugs. And, I'm trying to find my spot here, as a result, the minds of thousands, I would say today millions, are enfeebled, debased, and even crazed. Are there crazy people in our world today? You want to know why they're crazy? Is because they're getting caught up in their social media feeds and it's debasing their minds. They're getting so agitated and agitated and agitated until they go out and do something crazy. She wrote this 100 years ago. Satan, and listen to this line. This is the one that got me. This is the line that got me. Satan is doing more through the production of the press, talking about these news channels, to weaken the minds and corrupt the morals of the youth, youth than by any other means. This is like Satan's number one strategy to get people upset and distracted and agitated and diverted from the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing more powerful than this, what Satan is using. If you thought Hollywood was the problem, Hollywood has its own problems, but this is worse. Your newsfeed is worse than what Hollywood is putting out today. 
because it has more impact on you. Am I making sense? Satan is doing more through the productions of these news channels to weaken, corrupt the morals than by any other means. Wow, I just read that. I couldn't hardly, didn't know what to think. Friends, we have to keep our minds on Jesus, amen? And the freedom that only he can give. We have to go to him for that freedom. You're not going to get it from this world. Can't get ourselves caught up in those things. We can't get wrapped up in trying to claw our freedoms back or prevent ourselves from losing some freedom or something. What we need to focus on is the freedom that only Jesus can give. The freedom that no one can take away. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court does or what the president does or, or what Congress does. None of those things can take away the freedom that Jesus gives. So, Seventh-day Adventists have actually a unique and much-needed message for this time in Earth's history. Amen? We have a message that is extraordinarily relevant and adapted to what is happening in our world right now. It's found in Revelation chapter 14. We call it the three angels' messages. That message is critical to what we, it's what we need to be preaching right now. Not any other message. This is the message. Volume 9 of the Testimonies, page 19. You've heard this before, I'm sure. She says that we've been given a work of the most solemn import. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. We are to allow nothing else to absorb the attention. Have you read that quote before? Have you heard that? There's nothing more important than giving this message. And I, I used to wonder, like, well, why is it so important? But when I see what's happening in our world today, I understand why that message is absolutely vital. Can we do a little bit of review on the three angels' messages? That needs to be like our bedrock. This is like the foundation of our identity as Seventh-day Adventists. This is why we were raised up to give this message to the world. And I believe we are raised up to give that message at this time. Well, you know the passage, just walking through it again in your mind. You can turn there, Revelation 14, if you want. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to summarize what it says. Without proving everything from the Scripture, if you're not familiar with that passage, you don't understand the prophecies, I beg you to get with someone that can explain them to you and study those things, because these are important messages. But for the rest of us who understand that passage fairly well, just to remind you what it actually says... It begins in verse 6 with this wonderful prophecy, prophecy, uh, prophecy, this wonderful prediction that the everlasting gospel is going to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This is a global message. Amen? A global message. And the words of that everlasting gospel is found in verse 7. The everlasting gospel consists of a message that says we need to fear God, we need to give glory to God, and we need to worship Him. Now, but I interpret that, at least, just very simply. When it says we need to fear God, that means we need to make him first in our life. We can't be fooling around with God. He has to have first place. All our hopes and our dreams need to be centered in him. He deserves all the glory. Right? Give glory to him. Worship him. Worship him alone. We can't be distracted chasing after other gods. He has to be our sole focus. The first angel's message is everlasting gospel is a call to turn back to the only God that can give us the freedom that we need for the crisis that's coming. It's a call to separate from the world, to detach from the things of this world and attach ourselves to God. We have to get connected with heaven. We have to. It's vital. The world is going a different direction. I don't care which party you think is going to bring you the solution. It's not going to work. The only one that can give us the solution we need is Jesus Christ. And the first angel's message says we need to go back to him. It also is a reminder that the hour of God's judgment is come. Now, we sometimes sort of abstract that and and talk about something that happened a long time ago in 1844, but I believe the hour of his judgment is taking place right now. We are being weighed in the balance. Our nation is being weighed in the balance, and it's going to be found wanting. I mean, we know the future. We know the fate of this country. It's specified in prophecy. 
Is it okay if I keep going? We're about to disconnect ourselves fully from righteousness as a nation. It's about to happen. And we know exactly what is going to bring about that disconnection from God that will bring in the wrath of God, that will bring in the judgments of God. We know exactly what it's going to be. We don't have to guess. We don't have to speculate. We may not know exactly when it's going to happen, but we know exactly what is going to happen. Amen? And when we see that happening, we know that the wrath of God is about to be poured out, that we are right on the brink. So we need to disconnect from the world. We need to attach ourselves to heaven. The world is going down. We cannot hang on to this world. It's not going to save us. We need to connect with heaven. That's our only hope. Now, the second angel's message comes right alongside the first one, and it has another warning. It says, another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city which made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon is fallen. We know that Babylon represents apostate Christianity, both mother and many daughters together. And we've been called to come out of Babylon. It's not the atheists, it's not the secularists, it's not the worldlings, it's not the irreligious. Babylon is professed Christians that are no longer following Christ. Amen? This is what the warning is about. We need to be worried about what's happening in Christian churches at the end of time. We should be watching what's happening in Christianity. And when you know, Babylon began to fall back in 1844 when they rejected a message from heaven, but they've been falling steadily ever since. And it's getting worse and worse. What's happening in Christianity today is becoming very problematic for Christians. Amen? John predicted this would happen 2,000 years ago. At the end of time, Babylon would be completely fallen, completely corrupt, completely apostate, completely separated from the Spirit of God. Modern Christianity has made all nations drunk. That's why this country is going to abandon, abandon our freedom, our principles of freedom is because the church is going to convince the government that church and state need to come together. Instead of being separate, they need to come together. Christianity will have lost its appreciation for the value of religious freedom. No longer cherish the separation of church and state. Many preachers in many churches are arguing for this vehemently today that church and state need to come together. They're deceiving the governments of the world to think that this is going to produce positive results. They will pressure the government to give in to church power. The nations are drunk with what Babylon is saying. You know what fornication is, I mean, in this context? It's when church and state get in bed together. That's what it's talking about. Amen? Am I exaggerating or misconstruing this in some way? James 4.4 4 says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? When the church becomes friends with the world and goes after the political leaders of this world to get its will imposed, then we know that they've become the enemies of God. They've separated themselves from God. The Bible is warning us right here That when we see the church scrambling for political power, when it stops advocating for the separation of church and state, and it starts arguing for the collapse of that protection which we have, then we know that we are right at the end. We know the church is fully apostatized. It's fully turned away from God. I'm not talking about our denomination. I'm talking about in general, Christianity. We know the end is near. There are a lot of things to be concerned about in the world. There's a lot of problems. I'm not trying to minimize any of the problems that are out there, but I'm saying this is what the Bible is warning us about. This is the one thing the Bible says you need to watch out for this. When you see this happen, you know that we're at the end. Amen? By the way, note that the governments of the world are not just drunk with this fornication. It says they're drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Have you seen any angry preachers lately? I don't know if you've listened to any of these speakers from other churches on YouTube or whatever, but there are some angry preachers. They're furious. 
because they can't get their way. They're afraid that they're not going to be able to have influence. And so they're furious, they're angry, and they are saying some terrible things. There, it's the wrath. When, when you see that wrath, instead of worrying about representing Jesus Christ, the meek and lowly Jesus, they're more worried about getting their way in the political system than we know that the church has turned away from God. It's lost its dependence on God. It's looking to the political realm instead. Remember that verse. They're drunk with rage. And it's true. It's all over Christianity. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Do you realize that when we are angry about what's happening in the world, and we do not put that anger away, right? We go to bed without resolving that anger that we're giving place to the devil. Did you realize that? People are getting taken over by the enemy because they are unwilling to let go of their anger about what's happening in the world. Amen? I heard one amen over here. Amen? We cannot allow, allow ourselves to be angry about what's happening in the world. We have to turn to God. He's in control. He's going to take care of things. Our focus has to be on him. Do not give place to the devil in your life. Don't do it. If you are angry, then get that resolved before you go to bed tonight. You know why the mingling of church and state is so dangerous? Look at the third angel's message. The third angel says that there's going to be a, an attack on our religious freedom, specifically the mark of the beast, the beast, the false prophet. They're going to impose on every person a requirement to receive the mark of the beast, and if they don't, they're not going to be able to buy or sell. This is what will happen whenever church and state merge together. It always leads to persecution. And when we see it happen in this country, when we finally turn our back on the principles of freedom upon which this nation was established, when we see that happen, we know the mark of the beast is coming. It's right around the corner. Now, I don't know if it's going to be very soon or we might still have a little more time. I'm just saying, when we see the church and state come together and take power, then we know persecution is just, to come, is just ahead. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise that this is going to solve our problems, this is going to help us. It will be the end of freedom in America when the church takes power. And I personally think we may very well be right on the brink of that. False prophet, the United States of America, in sync with apostate Christianity, the church and government combined, will insist that all men receive the mark of the beast under the most severe civil penalties to those who refuse. If you are a true Bible-believing Christian, of course, that keeps the law of God, you will not be able to comply with that requirement, and so you will be subject to oppression and persecution. But you're not going to be able to give in to that because we know that whoever does give in to the mark of the beast is going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of it. You don't want that. It's going to be a difficult time. This great controversy says, let the principle once be established, one time in this country, in the United States, that the church may employ or control the power of the state that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. Let that happen one single time in this country, she says, and the triumph of Rome is assured. Our fate is sealed. It's inevitable. It cannot be reversed. If it happens one time in this country, then we're lost as a nation because it cannot be turned back. That's serious. Amen? Look, if you really want to understand what's coming... I urge you to go back and read the chapter in the Great Controversy called The Final Warning. In fact, I would urge you to read it once a week, every week, until you know it backwards and forwards, until you understand exactly what it's saying, till it sinks in. We cannot allow ourselves to be diverted by any other kind of message than the final message. Let me just share a few quotes from that chapter. Just, I'm going to kind of skim through it, put it together to lift out the highlights. I'm not going to give you all the page numbers. Just go back and read it. I'll just share a few thoughts. Page 605. Predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States 
that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God have been pronounced as groundless and absurd. Oh, it's never going to happen. In the, well, it's happening right now. People are pushing for this uh, aggressively. It's happening. We're on the brink. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But as the events seen, excuse me, as the events so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, the third angel's message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. When we see this happening, something is going to take hold of God's people. They're going to say, you know, this is exactly what we've been predicting for 150 years or 160 years or however long it's been. We've been predicting this for all these years and it's starting to happen. And something is going to take hold of God's people. Something's going to grip them and say, it's really happening. The very thing that we predicted is actually happening right now. And they're going to wake up, they're going to rise up, and they're going to be empowered by the Spirit of God. When we start to see church and state uniting, God's faithful messengers are going to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to expose that merger for what it is. It is contrary to the nature of God. Christians everywhere are being led to think that this is the work of God to bring church and state together, and we will expose it for the lie that it is. It is not God's will. Men of faith and prayer, she says, will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. And listen to this. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The apostasy in the church will be exposed. The, the fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, that's going to be exposed. The merger of church and state, it's going to be shown that that is not God's will. The stealthy, excuse me, the inroads of spiritualism. This is the third thing. And by the way, we think of spiritualism, we're always thinking of like seances and stuff. But spiritualism just means that, the Holy, that a spirit is communicating with human beings. Seances are just one form of spiritualism. You realize that, right? Another form of spiritualism is when you have apostate Christians that are receiving messages they think is from the Holy Spirit, but it's actually from demons. And there are churches all over this country that are getting prophetic messages that they are attributing to the Holy Spirit, making all kinds of claims. That is spiritualism. And that's going to be exposed. And the stealthy but rapid progress of papal power and its influence, all of these things are going to be exposed under the final. This will be the final warning. She tells us exactly what it is. We don't even have to guess. All these will be unmasked by the solemn warnings. Listen to this. People will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will hear who have never, will listen who have never heard words like these before. Something is going to happen when we see this take place. God's people are going to raise up and start giving that message. And thousands of people are going to respond. They're going to say, wow, I've never heard this before. Seventh-day Adventist movement was raised up to give this message to the world for such a time as this. Now, if you keep reading in that chapter, what you'll discover in the next few paragraphs, it says that there are many thinking people watching these events taking place that are going to respond to the message. They're going to be convicted of the truth in those messages. There will be an incredible power that attends those messages. Those are things she says. There will be an incredible power when this message is given, and thinking people are going to recognize this is the truth. They're going to know it's the truth. But it will only madden those who oppose it. They're going to become more and more angry, more and more furious because they cannot refute it. The efforts to combine church and state when it's exposed, the people that are behind that movement are going to become furious at the people that expose what they're doing. And the more it's exposed, the more angry they will become. And now listen to this. You may not know this one. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power to stop this message from being preached. And in this work, both papists and Protestants unite. So they're going to do something to try and stop this message because thousands of people are waking up and they're being exposed and they're furious and they're going to do whatever they can to stop the message. Well, what 
do you think they're going to do to try and single out the people that are giving that message? If you wanted to single out Seventh-day Adventists, how would you do it? What does every Seventh-day Adventist have in common? We all keep the Sabbath. Specifically, she says that this fury against those denouncing the linking of church and state will make bold and decided moves for Sunday legislation. It's exactly what happened in Ezra's day. They wanted to, they wanted to single out the Jews, so they passed a law that singled out the Jews. That was a way to silence them, the way to stop them. And when they want to silence Seventh-day Adventists so they stop exposing the merger of church and state, the best way to do it is to pass a Sunday law. It's going to be because we give this message that the Sunday law is passed. Did you know that? The Sunday law is passed to stop Seventh-day Adventists from preaching the three angels' messages. That's why. If you want to single up Adventists for persecution, if you want to silence them, this is exactly how I would do it. Many will be arraigned before the courts, make a strong vindication for the truth. Light will be brought before thousands as a result who would otherwise know nothing of these things. So that's going to create opportunities to share the message. But as the opposition rises to a fiercer height, the servants of God are going to be perplexed. It seems that they brought upon themselves the crisis. If we just hadn't exposed it, if we just hadn't given that warning, if we just hadn't said what we said, then maybe they wouldn't be so angry. They wouldn't be so upset with us. Maybe they wouldn't have done this. We brought this on ourselves. They're going to be overwhelmed with this. But conscience and the word of God assure them that their course is right. The enthusiasm which animated them is gone. Yet they cannot turn back. Amen? They remember that the words which they have spoken were not theirs, but his that bade them give the warning. God put the truth into their hearts, and they could not forbear to proclaim it. Can you say amen to that? Difficult times are ahead, but God is going to raise up people, I believe, right in this room to give the three angels messages and expose what the enemy is doing. It's coming. Maybe another few election cycles, or it could be right around the corner, but it's coming. To human wisdom, uh, back up, some will be thrust into prison, some will be exiled, some will be treated in terrible ways. All of this to silence the messenger. Or to silence the message, the three angels' message. To human wisdom, she says, all this now seems impossible. But friends, the reality is the restraining Spirit of God is gradually being withdrawn from the apostate churches. It's going to be withdrawn fully soon. And those that are advocating for the merger of church and state, when they fall under the complete power of the enemy, she says that the human heart can be very cruel when the Spirit of God is withdrawn. So it may seem like you can't imagine your Christian brothers turning on you, but they are already getting angry and furious, and they've drunk the wine of the wrath of Babylon, and they're, getting, they're, they're angry already. Then the final test will come to every soul. Will we obey God or will we obey man? That will be the test. Again, I don't know the exact timing, but I believe there's a very good chance that right here in this room we could see that happen in the near future. And if we want to make it through to the end, here's what we need to do, just to summarize. Number one, you need to understand that the only freedom that's going to help you is the freedom that Jesus gives. It's not what government gives you. It's not what your constitution gives you. It's not what the Supreme Court gives you. It's not what your president gives you. It's the only freedom that's going to help you is what Jesus gives you. Amen? Amen? This is, the, this is vital. We cannot make it through without the Holy Spirit to help us. We absolutely have to have it. And second, we should have nothing to do with the mingling of church and state. We should get as far away from that as possible. This is the exact thing that God is warning us about, and this is what's going to bring in the wrath of God. It's not all the other terrible things that are happening in our world. It's when this the Christianity of our world unites itself with politics that that will bring in the judgments of God. That is it. 
When any church appeals to the state to enforce its values or principles, this is a clear sign that God is no longer with that church. And we should have nothing to do with that kind of movement because we know where it's going to end up. And three, that is my last point, we need to remember where all this is heading. What's happening in our world, we need to know where this is going. We need to know where it's coming from, the religious leaders that are pushing this agenda, where it's heading, what the end result is going to be. We need to understand these things, and we need to start giving the warning that God has given to us. So we need freedom, but true freedom, the kind that Jesus gives, that only Jesus can give. We should have nothing to do with the merger of church and state, and we must never forget where this is heading because it's just around the corner. Amen? So it's a solid message, but it's a message that someone, some point, is going to have to start giving. And I suggest the sooner, the better. If we're serious about the latter rain being poured out, if we're serious about seeing the work finished, if we're, seeing, we're serious about seeing an outpouring of spiritual power on God's people at the end of time, then we need to know the message that's going to bring all of this to pass. And we need to be able to recognize it when we hear it, so when we hear a counterfeit message, we're not going to be distracted. We have much to be thankful for in this country. We still enjoy great freedoms, and praise God for that. Maybe we will still have them for a little while longer. And let's enjoy them while we have them. But let's never forget what is coming. The end time scenario has been spelled out for us. We know exactly what to expect. It's just a matter of time. And perhaps soon. I want to close with a simple appeal. I always like to do this. It's not really for my benefit, but I think sometimes the Holy Spirit is speaking during a message to hearts, and this is an opportunity for the people that are listening to respond back to God, right? So this is what I like to do. I like to make a small appeal. Jesus offers a freedom that no government can ever give. Amen? doesn't matter what the world does. It can never give you that freedom, nor can it take that freedom away. It's independent, completely separate from the things of this world. I wonder, as we've looked at this topic tonight, that maybe there's someone here that wants to say, Lord, I want that freedom, that freedom that only you can give. I want that freedom in my life. Can I see your hand? Amen. Praise God. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for giving us your word, which spells out the future in such remarkable detail. I thank you for the testimonies that have been given to your end time people to make it even more clear, more detailed. And Lord, we recognize that we may very well be right on the brink of the final crisis. Maybe we have a little more time. I don't know. But regardless, we want the freedom that only you can give. We want it now. We're not waiting for the crisis. We want that freedom today. We want the hope of righteousness by faith, the, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You saw almost every hand went up in this room. I pray, Father, that you would grant them that heart cry for the freedom only you can give. And I thank you, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.